Philanthropy in the literal sense of that expression. Bob joined the Center on Philanthropy at a time when the field of philanthropic studies was virtually non-existent. With him at the helm, the Center and our Center here at IUPUI grew to become the premier institution for the study of philanthropy and inspired others across the country and around the globe to join us in that study as well. Bob wasn't just a giant in the field. As we'll hear later, he really created the field. But Bob's most important contributions to philanthropic studies were of a less quantifiable nature. With the institutionalization of the field, he saw that the practice of philanthropy threatened to overshadow its philosophical underpinnings, and that the narrow focus on narrow, and I don't use that in a pejorative way, on nonprofit management among some of our programs risked severing the concept from the philanthropy, the philanthropic values that were it at its core. Bob's seminal definition of philanthropy as voluntary action for the public good underscores its essentially moral nature. We can always ask the question, how voluntary and, how, and what's the public? But we do have to recognize that he steers us in a moral direction. Recognize that, the, at, that at philanthropy is in here, his words, and I quote the chancellor here, the principal means by which our ethics and values shape the society in which we live. He was resolute in, in, in his commitment to strengthening his philosophical, ethical, intellectual, and all the other foundational parts throughout rigorous interdisciplinary study. It is this moral core, moreover, that makes philanthropy such a rich, rich complex field of study, one in which, as Bob observed, there are no ethical answers, there are only ethical questions. With characteristic, characteristic vision, Bob saw that scholars and practitioners alike needed an education that would equip them to grapple with difficult moral issues and make sound moral choices. To that end, he advocated a multidisciplinary liberal arts approach to the study of philanthropy and the works of, of thinkers like William James, Mahatma Gandhi, and Immanuel Kant were just as instrumental from his perspective that as the teaching of uh, and, in, and, and immersing people in the report of the Filer Commission, which is also here in the archives. Through his insistence that theory informs practice and practice informs theory, Bob reached, breached life in the, into the study, in the, to the study of philanthropy. Leading by example, he breathed life in the study of philanthropy, sorry. Leading by example, he both challenged and inspired his students, colleagues, and countless others whose lives he touched to cultivate the compassion and intellectual curiosity to keep ethics at the heart of our good work. As Bob put it so astutely in one of his many writings on the subject, involvement in good works is essential to the good life. One place to find meaning, he said, purpose and hope, is in participation with others in voluntary action for the public good. Good works provide an important avenue into the good life. Today, we celebrate the fact that Bob truly lived the good life. I'm honored to have known Bob as my colleague, friend, and mentor, and I know that everyone here shares my gratitude for all he taught us about, about living the good life, about dedicating our lives to the public good. And it's now my pleasure to introduce one of the first graduate students at the Center of Philanthropy, Michael Moody. It's my role, as I understand it here, to speak on behalf of the students of Mr. Payton, the former students of Mr. Payton, or rather, those people who learned from him explicitly as students, because I dare not try to speak for everyone who would call themselves a student of Mr. Payton, or else I would be speaking for, I think, everybody in this room. Mr. Payton's former students are relatively small in number, but we are zealous in our devotion to his mission. And we're now out in the world doing diverse and meaningful things all across the globe. And it may sound immodest for me to say that about myself and my colleagues, but part of it is my pride in what my colleagues are doing and my admiration for what they are out there doing in the world on behalf of Mr. Payton and what he is able to accomplish in a way through us. One of us is teaching in Tunisia, teaching college in Tunisia. One can't be here today because he's on a plane going to Kenya for work. One is doing on the ground um, community organizing in the f newest nation on earth, South Sudan. Here in the United States, these Peyton acolytes are uh, doctors and lawyers and professors and business people, fundraisers and grant makers, stay-at-home moms and dads, and people 
in all sorts of other ways engaged in their community in communities all across the country. And I take a lot of heart in knowing that Mr. Payton would be proud of this. I also know that he would say that's exactly as he planned it. <laughs> so before I go further, let me um, make it really, let me explain why I call him Mr. Payton. Uh, I call him that because he told me to. Uh, a couple of days after I started to work for him in 1989, I, um, I wrote on a memo in the two field, and we still wrote things on p actual pieces of paper at that, <laughs> that point, I wrote Bob. Um, and he sent it back to me later in the day, and he crossed out Bob and wrote Mr. Payton. Um, and I thought why he did that was because he was my boss. Um, and, but later that day, he gave me an explanation, and it's an explanation that's actually kept me doing what I was told to do now for 22 years, for fully half my life. Um, even now as I've gotten to be old enough to be a mister myself. Uh, Mr. Mr. Payton explained that um, he did that not because he felt like he needed to, do, to have me use the honorific so that I would um, revere him or maintain his authority in some way. He didn't need a title for that. Um, he did it because he felt it signified what our relationship was going to be. And that was very deliberately a mentorship. Um, I realize now, I didn't realize it at the time, that that mentorship changed my life. Um, again, I think he would have said he meant it to. Um, and, and there are many, many other students uh, who came after me whom he also asked to call him Mr. Payton who would say the same thing um, about how he profoundly changed their life um, as their mentor. When I say this, I don't just mean that he transformed our professional lives. He certainly did that. He taught us about philanthropy and he told us um, often in the way that he, he taught us about philanthropy and, and, and told us the ways that we could engage in that world professionally. And he often taught us in a very uniquely um, uh, Peyton way of allowing us to browse through the stacks in the library in the basement, find a passage in a book that raised our passion, either pro or con, and then gently guiding us to understand the connection to philanthropy of that passion and, and giving us understanding of the discovery in a way that we could then take forward in our work. Um, but Mr. Payton was also our personal mentor as well as our professional mentor. He taught us how to live as good people while we sought the good society, as you've heard, through philanthropy. He taught us how to live a life of meaning, purpose, and hope. He taught us how to find joy even as we fight society's sorrows. He taught us how to smell the roses even as we try to reform the garden. He taught us these lessons as much by his actions as by his words. We saw how we witnessed as he sought out connections, meaningful connections with people, regardless of their apparent status. We saw how he revered his wife, how he loved his family, and how he was unashamedly smitten by small children, every single child that he encountered. And anybody in the room who was with him when a little toddler would waddle by knows exactly what I'm talking about. He could be in the most serious conversation with the most important visitor that he had and would stop the conversation and smile and marvel at the child walking by. And his mentees learned from him, I think, in that way as well. There's a lot of talk in history books, at least older history books, about great men. And Mr. Payton certainly qualifies as a great man by any measure. But I think, and certainly his formal biographical list of accomplishments demonstrate that, but it's, I think, the qualities of the man that, tra that are not found on that biographical list that really, I think, are the best evidence or, or for his greatness. One piece of evidence is that when you talk to people, and we heard it just with Gene, when you talk to people, they very often recall in very loving detail the first time they met him. He was a man that you remembered meeting for the first time. My own experience was that as a college senior, I went to see him because I was interested in a career in philanthropy, and he immediately proceeded to tell me that, well, maybe you didn't want to work in philanthropy because you could just as well do as much good, maybe more, by working in the corporate sector. Um, and even threw me a, a pithy John D. Rockefeller quote about how uh, the best thing you can provide for a man is a job. Um, luckily, he gave me a job before I was able to take his <laughs> advice. But that's an example of the powerful impression that a great man makes in that way. I think we also know that his powerful impression in this case also comes from his writing, his wonderful, lyrical, moving, inspired writing. Mr. Payton, as many of you know, wrote in a journal every day, and, and um, particularly later in his life. And one time he told me that uh, he spends two hours every morning, quote, having a conversation with myself in that journal. 
And when he said that, I, may, I thought of that famous, you probably know this famous John F. Kennedy quote. He had, he had a gathering of all the current Nobel laureates in the White House, um, and he, Kennedy said, there's never been a greater concentration of intellectual power here at the White House, except when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> and, I, and I think there's never been a more interesting conversation than the conversation that Bob Payton, Mr. Payton, had with himself, um, writing to himself. And finally, as you, many of you probably remember, Mr. Payton would often start his speeches by um, quoting one of his, uh, some advice from one of his favorite thinkers, William James. And once again, we've already heard about William James. Um, James, in one of his talks to teachers, said that um, one should always seek to make only one point per lecture. And Peyton would, Mr. Payton would quote this, and then he'd offer Peyton's corollary to James's law, <laughs> which, which was one should try to make at least one point <laughs> per lecture. So let me conclude by um, giving you my one big point, and it's my one big serious point. It's a point about how we mourn and commemorate someone we've lost. When faced with the passing of a loved one, Mr. Payton believed very deeply in the rightness of one key approach to mourning, and that was that we should not mourn our loss, but we should focus on and, and remember what we're grateful for from that person while we had them with us. This encouragement to focus on what we're grateful for was the first thing that he told me when I spoke to him after the love of his life, his wife of 60 years, passed away. And he would be proud to know it's the first thing that David told me when he called me to tell me that his father had passed. I think, though, the most powerful statement of this approach to gratitude in the face of loss really comes out, again, in one of his wonderful pieces of writing. It's a letter that many of you have probably read. It's written in Garden City, New York, on November 4th, 1982, the day after he found out that his oldest son, Joe, had died unexpectedly in Rwanda. And as visitors to the Joseph and Matthew Payton Library know, this was the second unimaginable loss that they had, that Mr. Payton and Polly and David had all experienced in less than a decade. Matthew had died um, about nine years earlier. Um, in the face, though, of such tragedy, Mr. Payton didn't write about cosmic injustice or about his anger or even about sadness. He wrote about the joys of Joe's life. He wrote about his awe at Joe's devotion to good works in difficult places. That is, he wrote about what he was grateful for and could be thankful for, not what he had lost. So let me quote a little bit. Polly and I, this is quoting, Polly and I have learned some things about the meaning of life and the meaning of love and the meaning of family, and if we could somehow share those, we would. We have been blessed by friends and parents and brothers and sisters and children in ways that make us feel very specially privileged. And let me stop and remind you, this is the day after he received this news, and he's using words about his experience. We have been blessed. We are specially privileged. Continuing, Joe lived a full and honorable life and died pas while passionately engaged in this honorable work. God is great and merciful, and life goes on. Mr. Payton wrote similar things about Matthew and about Mrs. Payton, focusing on what he learned from them and what he was thankful for. And so I say, let's all learn one final lesson as Mr. Payton's students. Let's adopt his approach to mourning, and let's remember, Mr. Payton lived a full and honorable life. We have been blessed and are specially privileged to have had his influence over our lives so profoundly, and we are grateful for that. And yes, life goes on. I believe in gratitude to him, we live that life in the way that he taught us. Thanks. And now I want to introduce Dean William Bloomquist, the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts. Our school is one of the schools at IUPUI that was most significantly changed by Bob's interest in and commitment to the study of philanthropy. The changes in our school are evident in our curriculum as well as the research conducted by a number of liberal arts faculty. As you've heard, beyond the study of philanthropy as human practice and human institutions was Bob's commitment to broad education, to liberal arts education, 
to ideas and talk.